Oh my god. Look at her butt. That's right, friends. We are here to do a rump roast. Welcome to Snappy Dragon Studios, where we combine actual fashion history content with pure, goofy nonsense. I'm V, and when this video comes out, it'll be my birthday. So please join me in celebrating another year of my existence by laughing about some of history's wildest fake butts. Now, I must thank my dear friend Opus Eleni's Discord server for coming up with this idea in the first place, and particularly Christina for the great pun itself. Somehow, a discussion of chair cushions led to each person present counting the number of cushions they owned, and I just had to ask, do bustle pads count as cushions? One person declared that a firmly stuffed bustle pad counted as not only a cushion, but a tailor's ham, at which point Christina called on the server to take her half-formed joke about a rump roast and go wild. Yes, if you iron your bustle pad long enough, it becomes a rump roast, but what happens if you affectionately make fun of your bustle pad? I promise, it, 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 it all made sense if you were there. But the upshot is, we are here today to roast some rumps, pads, and bustles because we can, and rank them in a tier list because we need some kind of structure for our mockery. This happens to be perfect timing as I have a very cool new thing to announce later on in the video, and it also involves bustles. But you'll have to stay tuned for that. If you wish to see all of the rumps that we shall roast and rank today, I'll have a full list on my Patreon with the rest of the source notes. Being that it is my birthday, I have received some excellent presents, and one in particular that I really want to show you. My sponsor, Brooklinen, sends me the nicest things, and their birthday present was no exception. Brooklinen makes high quality household goods that are worth investing in. Costumers and fashion history nerds know very well that it takes a lot of resources to produce textiles and is much better for both the environment and my budget to have long lasting sheets and towels than go through a lot of low end ones. My decor preferences tend to be very springy, but I wanted to change things up for fall without having to totally redecorate my room. So I left the curtains and greenery and everything, but changed out my usual pastel floral bedding for these deep jewel tone blues and greens. Linen sheets have been my ride or die since Brooklyn and sent me my first 100% linen set, but I could not pass up these colors. So I decided to try the Lux Hardcore Bundle. The Hardcore Bundle has a sheet set, a duvet cover, and extra pillowcases, and you can mix and match different colors and patterns. If anyone could make cotton sheets that were up to my standards, it would be Brooklyn and friends, these did not disappoint. They're everything a cotton should be, including Okiotech certified for safety. The Lux Satin Weave fabric is 480 thread count and a gorgeous soft sheen since it's the same weave that makes satin so shiny. They're smooth and tightly woven, more substantial and warmer than airy light percale without being too heavy. So they're perfect for what passes for fall in the Bay Area. If you find the texture of linen too rough for your tastes, these are for you. Let me tell you, I did not want to get out of bed this morning and not just because my fibromyalgia makes me groggy. If you want to stock up on bedding to bath essentials for 2023, Brooklinen is giving my viewers $20 off any order over $100 using my code SNAPPYDRAGON20 at checkout. Use the link in my description. Wonder if I have time for a quick nap. Last time you took a nap, it was three hours and you were useless after. Don't you dare. Seriously? It's my birthday and you won't even let me nap. It's your birthday when this video comes out, which is not for another two weeks. Now get back in here, we have rumps to roast. Now, let me explain our tiers, since this is a tier list after a fashion. Up top, we have cake, which seems fitting for my birthday video. A superlative example of what a skirt support should be. Great silhouette, not uncomfortable to wear, makes the skirt look cool, and bonus points for any extra comedic value. Below that, peach emoji, an adequate skirt support, Perfectly nice, but lacking a certain gravitas, which would make it dessert instead of a healthful snack. I've abandoned my usual five tier structure because it just didn't make sense. So our third tier is donkey. Uncomfortable, weird looking, or just ineffective. And finally, our bottom tier is called, well, the bottom. This skirt support is so strange, impractical, or injurious to the wearer, 
I question whether anyone actually wore it, and if they did, I hope they upgraded in short order. I do also want to make clear, these rankings are purely my opinions. They are completely subjective and for comedic purposes only. I don't think it's really possible to rank skirt supports from best to worst in an objective way, unless you have much clearer criteria like how easy is this to make or potential to injure the wearer. I'm not the fake butt police, and I am not here to yuck anyone's gums. You may argue with me as much as you like in the comments, as long as we all keep it light and funny. As per usual, we have notes on ye old tablet. First up for ranking and roasting is the late 18th century split bum. This has got to be one of my favorite underskirt cushions ever, because the form, the function, the sheer comedic potential. I mean, just, lo just look at this thing. It does create a really amazing shape under the skirts of the variety of gown it was meant to be worn under. The fact that it's got the two separate cushions allows the pleating in the back to fan out really nicely. You get sort of a heart shape to it and you get the point of the gown or the center back pleat to sort of drop in between the cushions slightly that just give it, it shows off the construction in a really really wonderful way and without a gown over it it looks utterly hilarious i mean this thing has two cheeks how can you not love and laugh at this ridiculous thing i rate this one cake if I didn't already own one, I'd want one for my birthday. However, split bums, as they were called, were not the only variety of false rump worn to fluff out the skirts of 18th century gowns. There were a variety of other shapes, which I will be considering together as a category. Oftentimes you'd see sort of like this wide C-shaped cushion sort of thing. I think the shape of these under the dress is not quite as nice because you don't get that like heart-shaped fan out effect with the pleating, but they're certainly not bad. You get great skirt fluff out of these guys. However, I do have some very amusing historical anecdotes to share about them. According to viewer at practicing.stitchcraft, false rumps were called Vibespeck in German, which translates to ladies ham or ladies bacon. I shall be taking suggestions in the comments for kosher alternatives, although uh, I suppose it doesn't need to be kosher since hopefully you're wearing a false rump instead of eating... Wait, we're not going there. Anyways, another viewer, Avery, sent in this delightful primary source anecdote from the Norfolk Chronicle on July 4th, 1778, which I shall read out for your amusement. On Sunday evening, a very ludicrous accident happened at Henley-upon-Thames. A large party from town went after tea to enjoy the coolness of the evening on the banks of the river. Youth and spirits hurried them into such sallies of vivacity that in running with too much precipitation, a lady's foot tripped and she fell into the Thames. The consternation was general, but somehow everyone was surprised to see her swim like a fishing float, half immersed and half above the water. It seems that the lady had been furnished with an immoderate sized cork rump which buoyed her up so completely that she looked like Venus rising from the water. She was towed to shore by a gentleman's cane without the least injury but wet petticoats. I suspect the story was somewhat exaggerated, but my goodness, what an image! One of the stuffing materials for false rumps was ground cork, so it certainly would float, just perhaps not this way. These get a peach emoji on account of being hilarious and fully functional, but not quite as good as their double-lobed cousins. Inflatable crinolines, precursors to the big bell-shaped tube skirts of the 1850s. I see these getting talked about a lot. The evidence given for their existence is actually satire. There's two satirical cartoons about them that I see around fairly often. There's this one from the comic Almanac in 1849, and then this one from Punch Magazine in 1857. Uh, Punch in particular absolutely loved to make satirical cartoons about hoop skirts. It was, it's a good time, but you gotta recognize them for what they are. The only mention I can find in these that is not a satire is from Duluth University Magazine in 1858, explaining all of the ways that inflatable rubber tube skirt supports are great in theory, but not in practice. And they're not wrong. In addition to the danger of puncturing or popping the hoop skirt, sulfur was also used in rubber manufacturing at the time. So these things would not be pleasant or really good for the health of the wearer or anyone in close proximity. Also, part of the reason that stiffened hoop skirts are wearable and the sort of thing you can move around in at all is they have some way of collapsing into a smaller shape, whether that's shifting the hoops or compressing the material if it's like a horsehair petticoat or something very starched. Inflatable crinolines would have had to be a lot stiffer than that. 
think like a balloon or the sort of stiffness that keeps a bounce house upright. Good luck making your way through any space smaller than your skirt without a lot of trouble. I rate these the bottom on account of being thoroughly impractical and also, I can't find much evidence that anybody ever wore these or that they ever took off. Like, I'm sure some existed and I'm sure some people tried. I just think they've regretted their choices really quickly afterwards. 16th to 18th century bum rolls. These were, well, roll shaped. Uh, skirt supports that were essentially just a tube of padding that was cut in a shape to fit around the hips. And I just, the word bum roll. This will never not amuse me, no matter how much I try to act like a dignified lady. I have one of these. I think it was actually the first skirt support I ever owned because I bought it for a Ren Faire costume. And I've probably spent a lot more time in it than a lot of my other skirt supports because of wearing it to Ren Faires. They're not bad. They give your skirts a nice fluffing. They make your waist look tiny because you've got something big and padded right next to it. But they can also look kind of awkward without a lot of petticoat over them, whether that's heavy material or a lot of layers. My my favorite way to wear mine is put it on under two layers of petticoats and then hike the top one up to show the bottom contrasting one. You get a lot of fluff, it sort of smooths out the shape, and then you have a ton of space underneath to hide things in your underskirt pockets, like frozen water bottles. I'm gonna give these a peach emoji. Tried and true, if a little bit finicky. This next one was a viewer submission, a fabric bustle sent in by Steen Larson. Thank you. The dress in question was originally a crinoline dress, so big round skirt. Generally, when fashions changed, what you would do to remake something like this is pull a panel out of the skirt or something, use that extra fabric to create drapery, and then recut the skirt to have more of a fashionable, slimmer, bustly shape. This was how a lot of gowns survived the transition from the rounder or even more back-heavy round style of the 1860s into the first bustle era of the 1870s. The wearer or owner of this gown seems to have decided, maybe I can just, you know, fluff the skirts up as tall as possible and relying on nothing other than the puffy power of silk taffeta, I'll get a bustle gown out of it. Look how high this thing is standing up with, according to the article on it, nothing other than the puffy power of silk taffeta and some cleverly placed ties. I rate this one cake for sheer ingenuity and determination. Well done. 1870s and 80s bustle pads. I have one of these in my collection made from the instructions in Isabella Pitcher's Victorian dressmaker book for uh, the dress that I made for my ancestor Carolina, which was in 1881-ish fashion. This absolutely does all the things a bustle pad should do. I wore this thing for three days of hardcore filming running around New York City. It gave the dress a great shape. It was comfortable. It wasn't super heavy. It provided amazing lower back support when I was sitting on the New York subway going from shoot to shoot. But but it just isn't exciting. I don't know, like the, the, there's nothing about it that makes me go, ooh, that's cool looking. So I rate this a peach emoji for, it's, 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 it's good. I just, I can't really say anything dramatic about it. I promise you all this tea mug is not just for show. Hydrate friends, especially if you're gonna talk as much as I do. Many viewers have asked about this and I hate to disappoint you. So yes, we will talk about the chair bustle. It is quite an invention, I do agree. And a special shout out to the fact that the best known patent for it was taken out by a woman in San Francisco. So it is kind of a cool local invention for me. Here's my problem with it from a functional perspective. The structure of this thing is rigid. The advantage of things like lobster tail bustles is that they collapse enough that you can fit through smaller spaces and they're lightweight. So if you hit something, it's not heavy. You're not like swinging, oh, I don't know, an entire wooden chair off of your butt into whatever you collide with. If you smack somebody accidentally while wearing this chair bustle, you're gonna do some damage. If you're wearing this thing, you can't sit in an ordinary chair. It won't collapse enough for you to sit. I know I would get very sick of the strange looks and explanations I would have to give if I was wearing this thing just out in the world going about my life. I can only imagine in a society that valued conformity as much as the Victorians did, a Victorian lady would get even more sick of having to deal with those looks and give those explanations. I don't see much evidence for this ever having been taken up or, or used by a significant number of people. As Scientific American magazine suggested in 1887, a relief for people whose jobs had them working behind a counter or a bar, where it is a really good thing to be able to go from sitting to standing very quickly without having to move a chair around. Otherwise, I rate this donkey as a compromise between great cleverness and greatly limited utility. This down quilted petticoat from around 1860 
Quilted petticoats were not a new thing, but normally it was like a layer of quilted fabric. And yeah, it was stiff and puffy and held shape, maybe more than a single layer of fabric. This one is literally just filled to fill the space that would be taken up by a hoop skirt. I like to joke that my wintertime wardrobe of wool walking skirts with linen or cotton petticoats underneath is like wearing a blanket and bed sheets. And this is like taking it a step further because you're like, you're wrapping a down comforter around your waist. It's filled with goose feathers. And I figure it must have been so useful to people who are living without modern heating and insulation in the winter. Plus you get the volume of the big fashionable kind of back heavy bell shaped skirts at the time. I realize it's not that butt shaped, but I mean, it's a little bit it bigger in the back and it's stuffed. So I'm going to say it goes. Obviously you would not want to wear this in warm weather. I can also see it getting kind of heavy and maybe bulky enough that would be a little tricky to move in. I rank this a peach emoji. I love a good multifunctional garment and like how many of us have wished we could just go about our day and never get out from under our blankets? Ventilated bustle pads from the 1890s to the 1900s or so. This particular example is from the Met, and I have one in my collection that I have made and gotten a great deal of use out of. It's one of those things that makes your personal body image much less relevant. The Edwardians did not care what shape you actually were, you were going to pad your bust and pad your hips until you turned into an hourglass and your body image was more irrelevant than it is modern day. The ventilation really does make it comfortable, especially if you're gonna be wearing it in warm weather under lots of layers um, while getting any exercise. This one also gets bonus points for being great lower back support. I have been known to wear this on days when my lower back was bothering me and I wanted something that would like fill in that gap to keep your spine in a good shape when you're sitting in a straight back chair. That is where most of the padding actually goes when you wear a bustle pad like this. It's not over your butt, it's kind of filling out the space between your the waistband of your skirt and where your butt actually is. I rate this one cake, stylish, comfortable, and useful. At the other end of bustle pads from the 1890s to 1900s, uh, look at this example from the Met that looks like it's made out of wire mesh. It's like strapping one of those scrubby pads for cleaning cast iron to your butt. I guess I can see the appeal, like wire mesh is stiff and it holds its shape well, but I feel like something about the rigidity would would look kind of weird under skirts. Also like, God help you if something breaks because it's gonna stab holes in either you or your dress. I rate this the bottom for injury potential because uh, no, I am not a fan of putting yourself in danger for fashion, especially the kind of danger that you might need a tetanus shot after. This bustle also housed at the Met is not likely to injure you, but I still have some questions. There's actually two of these, but the second one is misclassified as being from the 18th century, even though the buckles and straps on it to me look like 19th century mass manufacturing. It's really hard to tell what shape this thing would make once you put it on a person and under a skirt because they only have photos of it laying flat. I think the fabric section is like graduated or something and kind of gored and skirt shaped. And then it's got like that one hoop towards the bottom, but like one hoop, this thing is a lampshade waiting to happen. Very like awkward shape of a hoop skirt where you don't have enough hoops or they're not graduated in a proper shape. So some of them stick out or you don't have enough petticoats under them. And you end up looking like, well, a lampshade rather than this. It's not even a hoop skirt. Like it's not a classic lampshade. It's just one hoop sticking off your butt. Like imagine how ridiculous this would look. I rate this donkey because yeah, this is not going to look good, but it's also like, it's not going to hurt you. This bustle from 1871 or so also housed in the Met does not have just one hoop. It has many historical undergarments like skirt supports are not necessarily satisfying to look at when they don't have the dress over them. They're satisfying once you put the dress over them and you see the effect, but it's so cool looking on its own. I love the waterfall effect from the graduated hoops. I think having each one set into sort of its separate fabric piece the way they are is gonna give them a little bit more like freedom of movement relative to each other than what you see in a lobster tail bustle where they're all connected to the same piece of fabric. I bet this thing looked so great under a dress. I really, really wanna see how it moves. Um, So, hey, uh, maybe one day the folks at the Met will uh, let me come in and 
play with the toys. I rate this cake for being a superlative and unique example of bustle kind. Let's finish with one of the more what the frock things I have seen in my quest to look at the strangest bustles and fake butts I can. This has got to be one of the weirdest shapes of bustle I've ever seen. The cross section is basically triangular. It's very narrow and pointed at the top. So you're gonna get basically a ridge going down the back of your skirt instead of like a, a, a curve. According to the museum page also, this thing is not filled with stuffing. That shape is coming from like coils of hoop wire. So it's not even like this is going to soften out and it just didn't get used to the point where it did soften out into a better shape. This thing is gonna hold. You're still gonna have a ridge running down the back of your skirt. And I, I can't see that being graceful or what anyone was going for. Also, this thing looks to me like you tied some flower sacks to your butt. Another donkey because uh, nothing about this seems graceful or stylish. I have one last bustle to share with you all, but this one isn't for the tier list. It's merch! Honored guests, I am delighted to announce to you that Snappy Dragon now has channel merch with a design that's been in my head for well over a year. Kiss My Bustle is available on shirts, mugs, stickers, and more through my new web shop. I think this is the perfect response for any time you meet the historical accuracy police, but I'm sure you'll come up with plenty of other uses too. Your purchase of these shiny, snarky objects supports my ability to devote my time to fashion history sass, which is the best birthday present I could possibly receive, and for which you have my undying gratitude. If you do get yourself something, I want to see it in action. Tag me in your social media posts at Miss Snappy Dragon and use the hashtag KissMyBustle. We do not have bed linens that say Kiss My Bustle, but Brooklinen's got you covered with bed sheets so comfy you won't care. Brooklinen is giving my viewers $20 off any order over 100 using my code SNAPPYDRAGON20 at checkout. Link is in the description. Thank you so much for attending my birthday celebrations, in a way. Please do go and turn the comments section into a party with your best skirt support stories. Or any skirt-related silliness if you don't wear skirt supports. I'll start. One time at Dickens Fair, I fit one of my castmates entirely underneath my hoop skirt. While you're there, click the button to tell YouTube you liked what you saw because we saw some very fine rumps. And subscribe for more fashion history sass. Sometimes we're serious and informative, I promise. You can find me around the internet at Miss Snappy Dragon on Instagram, Facebook, and very occasionally TikTok. And a full list of the rumps we roasted plus bonus costuming content at patreon.com slash snappy dragon studios. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have IRL birthday guests I should probably get ready for. See you next time! Oh, that is not fair.